1888, gamekeeper shot dead by a poacher in woods between Cold Harbour and Ockley in Surrey. This is a tragic case resulting in the loss of life of a young man. As with quite a few murders from the past and their subsequent trials, it makes you wonder how modern day forensics might have been applied. On Sunday the 25th of November 1888, William Groombridge, aged 23, employed by Mr Donald Heath, was shot dead by a poacher. On the previous evening, on Saturday the 24th of November, during the night and early the following morning, a party of gamekeepers and watchers, including George Holloway, George Scully, George Scully Sr., George and Stephen Weller, John Jenkins and William Groombridge, in the employ of different gentlemen living between Dorking and Ockley, met and proceeded upon a watching expedition in a location which was known for an abundance of game. After walking for some distance, the group heard a gun being fired, and they then proceeded in the direction from which the sound came. They saw two men in a wood known as High Trees Copse. This copse is not far from Broomhall, Cold Harbour, the residence at the time of Mr F Pennington, but the copse was on the estate of Mr Lee Steer. One of the two poachers, James Edwards, aged 43, was at once seized by George Holloway, a watcher in the employ of Mr Donald Heath, and George Scully, who was with him, and a struggle ensued. Some of the other keepers went off after the second man, who had immediately run off. After a short, sharp struggle, Edwards was overpowered and thrown to the ground. Just at that moment, Holloway saw the other man run by, closely followed by Groombridge. Almost immediately there was the report of a gun, and the unfortunate young keeper fell to the ground. Some of the others went to him, but the fallen man didn't move or speak. He had received the contents of the deadly weapon in his chest, and death had been almost instantaneous. The murderer, seemingly taking advantage of the hesitation and confusion caused by the horror of the moment, made good his escape. A cart was secured from Mr H. Catley of Broom Farm, and the body of William Groombridge was moved to the cottage occupied by his mother at Cold Harbour. Groombridge was seen by Mr Chaldicott, a surgeon of Capel, but Groombridge was already dead. James Edwards was taken to Jay's farm and then to Dorking Police Station and handed over to Superintendent Lambert. Soon afterwards, another navvy, known as Mousy or Mouse, but whose real name was George Belton, was passing Dorking Police Station, and as he was a known mate of Edwards, he was interrogated as to his whereabouts the previous night. Investigations followed, and it was found that Belton was not at Ockley or Cold Harbour at the time of the tragedy. Another arrest was made during the course of Sunday, but this person also proved to not be the man who fired the fatal shot. On Monday the 26th of November, at the Magistrates' Clerk's Office in Dorking, before L.M. Rate, James Edwards, who was with the man who killed the gamekeeper in the early morning of November the 25th, was charged with poaching at High Trees Cops. Statements from the gamekeepers and watchers confirmed the tragic events that led to William Groombridge's death. The defendant, James Edwards, was remanded until the following Saturday. Inquest on William Groombridge at the Plough in Cold Harbour The inquest on the body of William Groombridge was held at the Plough Inn at Cold Harbour on Thursday morning by the coroner, Mr G. F. Rumio. Mr Henry Roffey was foreman of the jury. The mother of the deceased, Margaret Groombridge, a widow, said she identified the body as that of her son, William Groombridge. He was an underkeeper. She last saw him alive on Saturday, November the 24th, when he was going to watch the wood, 
and he was brought back on Sunday morning dead. Stephen Weller, a carpenter living at Kitlands, said he was out with William Groombridge and others on Saturday night when they heard shots while they were at Bear Lodge. They went in the direction where the shots were fired. While some of the keepers were struggling to apprehend a suspected poacher, Groombridge ran by chasing another man and Weller followed several yards behind Groombridge. Weller went about a dozen yards beyond the men who were struggling and then stopped to look at them. Just as he started to follow Groombridge again, he heard a shot fired straight in front of him. When he heard the shot, he stopped and heard Mr Scully say, What is that lying in the ride? George Weller went to see and said that it was poor Bill. George Weller stayed with Groombridge until he was taken away. He was dead. Weller did not hear any words spoken before the shot was fired. John Jenkins, about 40 years of age, a watcher living at Mearshurst at Wootton, said he was called up on Sunday morning by Mr Scully just after three o'clock. He stated that Edwards had no gun, but he had two pheasants, a bag and a stick. Statement from James Edwards James Edwards, a labourer living in Dorking, said that on Saturday night last he came out with the other man between 9 and 10 in the evening. He did not know his real name, but he had heard him called Finisher in the Surrey Yeoman public house. He had in his possession a gun which was loaded. The witness only had a stick. The man who he was with had four shots and killed two birds, three shots just below Leith Hill and one shot where the keeper was killed. After he had struggled with one of them for a short time he gave himself up. Finisher was in front of him while he was on the ground. He heard the gun go off and somebody came back and said one of our men is shot. They were about 17 yards away from where the man was shot. He then went down and saw the man. He said, for God's sake, let us go and find the man. You all know me and I don't want to go away. He had known Finisher about a week. He first met him at the Surrey Yeoman the week before. He again saw him in the middle of the week in Dorking High Street and again saw him at about one or two in the afternoon at the Surrey Yeoman. Edwards arrived at the Surrey Yeoman at about six. Finisher came in at about seven o'clock. He said, are you coming along with me? Edwards asked him, where are you going? He said, to kill a few pheasants. Edwards said, I don't know as I'm going anywhere. Finisher then went out and came back soon afterwards and said, my wife is not at home. I cannot get the gun. They then had a drink or two of beer and the witness was getting the worse for liquor. Finisher said, a little after nine o'clock, come along. He went as far as the model lodging house with the man who pulled out the bag and in it a gun. They then went to Leith Hill. Edwards had never been out with him before. Walking along they had no conversation with regard to shooting the keepers. He believed that the name Finisher was given him through fighting. He had heard him tell somebody else that he had been shifted off Walton Heath. The reason he came with him was that he was a little beery, a little worse for wear. The gun was a single barrelled gun. He did not have a powder flask but had two sample bags, one for the powder and one for the shots. Finisher was about five feet five or five feet six inches tall, broad across the shoulders and nearly 60 years of age. His head was getting grey, with not much hair on the centre of his head. He had a rough and bushy beard which was also going grey. His nose was a little flat on the bridge and twisted a little to one side, and he talked through his nose. He had a lot of old scars on his face. He had a plushy waistcoat like those that navvies wear a brown coloured Macintosh for a coat, a long pair of dark cord leggings, so he could not see his trousers. 
He had a small kind of smoking cap of different colours with a tassel on it. He wore an old pair of boots. This description was also given by Belton and Penfold. When Edwards was caught, he didn't hear Finisher say anything. George Belton, a labourer living at Dorking, said he knew the man named Finisher by sight. He could not say whether that was his proper name. He knew his name was Finisher because he had worked with him at Reigate Chalk Pits. And he also went by the name of Love. That was 18 or 19 years ago. He hadn't seen him for years until a week ago last Monday. Finisher told Belton that he was not very well off, so Belton gave him a shilling. On Saturday last, he came and asked Belton's employer for a job, but he did not get one. Finisher asked Belton if he used a Surrey Yeoman, and Belton replied that he did not drink beer. They went to the Surrey Yeoman, and Belton gave him a pint of beer, while Belton had a bottle of ginger beer himself. He later saw Edwards and Finisher going up Dorking High Street. Superintendent Lambert commented that he had heard the man called Finisher, Jim Stevens, and had also heard him called Ticker. Thomas Penfold, the landlord of the Surrey Yeoman, said that he did not know the man Stevens by name. He only knew him by his coming into the Surrey Yeoman. He came in on November the 24th with Edwards. The man asked him to mind a parcel for him, and Penfold refused. Dr Henry Chaldicott, registered medical practitioner living at Capel, said at about eight o'clock on Sunday morning he was called to see the body of the deceased, William Groombridge. He had evidently died from the effects of a large gunshot wound in the side. Yesterday he made a further examination of the body. Three inches below the nipple on the left side there was a large irregular wound caused by the discharge of shot. Then between that and the middle line of the chest, there were several marks of scattered shot. The 7th, 8th and ninth ribs were completely carried across the abdomen and in a slightly backward direction. The greater part of the charge had evidently gone in the same direction, carrying away a portion of the buckle of his braces and lacerating the spleen, stomach and liver. The smaller portion of the charge had apparently been turned upwards by striking the ribs and had wounded the extreme apex of his heart and the left lung. The left side of the chest was full of blood and an injury to the heart must have caused death immediately. He was of the opinion that the deceased was struck whilst running with his left side towards the gun or that he was shot as he was turning the left corner of a path. The gun was not touching the body when it was fired, but it was at such a distance to allow the charge to commence scattering. The coroner, in summing up, said there was no doubt that the shot was fired by the man Stevens. The only question for the jury to consider was whether to return a verdict of manslaughter or murder. If they thought that he had fired intentionally at the stomach, then it would be murder but if they thought that he fired at the stomach accidentally, then it would be manslaughter. The jury, after a short consultation, returned a verdict of willful murder against Jim Stevens. The man is still at large. Stevens succeeded in eluding his pursuers and made for Tadworth, where he stayed the night in the cottage of someone who he knew, Mr Robert Duke, and his wife Sarah. Stevens then altered his beard and changed his clothes in order to avoid recognition, except the blue plush waistcoat. It is believed that it is this waistcoat which would lead to his apprehension. Sarah Duke stated, the Monday after the crime was committed, James Stevens came to our house at about seven o'clock in the morning. He sat down and seemed regularly tired out. He put his head in his hands. 
I asked him if he was not well, and he said that he was not, and asked me for a cup of tea to give him. I replied yes, and gave him a cup of tea and a bit of food. He informed me that he had started to go to a certain place and got lost, and had consequently been tramping all day and all night until he came to a stack where he laid down. He then returned. After he had eaten the food, he asked me if I had anywhere he could lay down, and I told him I had not, unless he laid down in the stable. This he did. He never said anything else to me. Stevens walked to Betchworth on the Monday afternoon following the crime and into the Barleymo public house. The landlady alarmed him by expressing the opinion that he was a murderer. After this, it appears he returned to Tadworth, but left that place during the night or early the next morning. His intimate knowledge of the district enabled him to get to London without detection. He subsequently tramped to Fenny Stratford, where he stopped at a lodging house. 6th of January 1889. The police at Fenny Stratford in Buckinghamshire telegraphed to Superintendent Lambert at Dorking Police Station that they had apprehended a man on suspicion of being the murderer and that he answered to the description being circulated. PC Card was dispatched to Fenny Stratford and on his arrival there he identified the prisoner as the man they were looking for and that under his charge was conveyed to Dorking. When Stevens was arrested at Fenny Stratford by the local police, he was wearing a light pair of trousers, the blue plush waistcoat with a smock over it, and an old round peaked hat, similar to that worn by seafaring men. He also carried a bundle with an old shirt in it, and a box containing nuts which he was selling. When PC Card called to arrest Stevens, he said to him, Hello Jim. You have got down to this quarter, have you? The prisoner, who maintained his composure, replied, You are lying like the rest and don't know me. The constable said he did know Stevens, and having a scar on his nose, he was confirmed in his opinion that the right man was in custody. During the journey from Buckinghamshire to Dorking, the prisoner made no reference to the crime. When arrested, he had in his possession four rabbit snares and underneath the plush waistcoat he was wearing three more. It appears that Stevens had been living at a common lodging house at Fenny Stratford under the name of Thomas Parker. He appeared much thinner and had aged considerably. On arrival at Dorking on Tuesday, he was brought before Gordon W. Clark and formally charged with murder, but no evidence was offered against him at this time. When told he would be remanded until Saturday when evidence would be given, he replied, Yes, sir. The prisoner appeared to be well known in the area, having worked at Betchworth, Kingswood and other places. There is much evidence to show that for many years James Stevens had gained his living in a precarious manner chiefly around this area in Surrey, where he was well known to the police. Poaching, it appears, was his favourite pursuit. In recent years, he had a severe encounter with a gamekeeper at Merston, and the circumstances were well remembered by the local police. Stevens was one of three brothers, who it is said came from Kent, and they were known to be strong, well-built men. But in the case of James Stevens, the hardships he has undergone in the course of his roving career have played considerable havoc with his constitution and his appearance. His favourite hunting ground appears to have been Kingswood, where he was known by the name of Jim Love. His suspicious movements in that locality brought him more than once to the notice of the police who cautioned him. Last November, just prior to the incident at Ockley, P.C. Card, who knew the prisoner well, again cautioned him with the result that he left Kingswood for Dorking with an elderly woman with whom he had for some time been living. At Dorking, he took up his abode in a common lodging house and resumed his usual mode of life. There followed his poaching expedition, which resulted in the killing of William 
Broombridge. Dorking Court, January 1889. The court was crowded and the appearance of the prisoner as he took his place was eagerly scanned by those present, many of whom were employed on neighbouring estates as gamekeepers or watchers. The prisoner, who is a man of short stature, wore the blue plush waistcoat already referred to and around his neck was a coloured choker. He has altered considerably and even those who knew him well by sight appear to have some difficulty in recognising him but it was no doubt that he is the man whom the police have been in pursuit of. In court, he affected an air of indifference, but it was evident to those who watched him closely that he was suffering from a considerable stressed disposition and anxiety. James Stevens was charged with the willful murder of William Groombridge. The prisoner pleaded not guilty. February 1889, the Surrey Winter Assizes. Mr J F Tor and Mr Gore Brown for the prosecution and the prisoner being undefended, Mr J Harvey Murphy was appointed to take the case on his behalf. Mr Tor, in addressing the jury, said that the prisoner, who appeared to get his living by travelling about, was particularly well known as a poacher and was well known under various aliases including Finisher, Ticker, Love and Parker. The prosecution detailed the evidence against Mr Stevens and laid particular stress that none of the keepers concerned in the affray carried firearms and that the only person having a gun in his possession was the prisoner. Inspector King said that on the afternoon of the murder he went to High Trees Copse and it was pointed out to him where the scuffle had taken place, and about 50 yards further down, the place where Groombridge was shot. He said that it was impossible to see exactly where Groombridge was shot from, where the men were scuffling, but admitted on being pressed that you could see 50 yards. Mr Murphy, for the defence, said that whilst the defendant was trying to escape from Groombridge, he ran into the thicket on the right-hand side, and when he had got a little way, he turned around to see if he was being followed. As he turned around, the trigger of the gun caught in one of the trees and accidentally went off. He asked the jury to use common sense and give their verdict as they thought fit. In summing up, his lordship complimented the learned counsel on his argument for the defence, but said the jury must look at the plain facts of the case. He then reviewed the evidence and emphasised the fact that the theory of an accident had not been given at any previous stage of the proceedings. The jury retired to consider their verdict at five minutes to six in the afternoon. On returning, the foreman said, We find him guilty of killing and not with felonious intent. We find him guilty of manslaughter. The sentence was postponed until the following Thursday, when James Stevens was sentenced to 20 years. James Edwards was sent down for 18 months hard labour.